Depression is extreme sadness or despair that lasts for more than a few days. It interferes with typical functioning, and it can even cause physical pain, um, like headaches or stomach aches. Um, as a therapist, I think of depression as an emotional state in which a person is pulling away from external life, from engaged life. They're kind of like going inward. Um, and it can feel very alone, isolating, shame-filled, and stuck. Welcome to Raising Adults, the groundbreaking parenting podcast that starts with the end in mind. We're your co-hosts, Dina Thayer and Kira Dorian. We created future-focused parenting to take families from surviving to thriving. So join us as we help you stop raising kids and start raising adults. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome back to Raising Adults podcast, and thank you for joining us for our mental health series. We're running four weeks of talking about kids and mental health and some of the specific stuff that you may or may not come across in your parenting journey with your kids. We really wanted to take an opportunity to talk about these things to help parents figure out, you know, what am I looking for? And if I do think I'm seeing something, what do I do? And also, super importantly, what don't I do? What should I not do? And so we've got experts on the show every single week talking about these different topics. And it has been really great so far, Dina, don't you think? Oh, so helpful. I think we're not only seeing some really great themes emerge, but we're also getting some really practical strategies, which you and I love. Yes, so do. it's been really nice. I've 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 learned a lot as well. And I think what you said is key about some of you might encounter these issues in your own family, and some of you might not, but you likely at least know someone who's dealt with this and maybe can send the episode their way or point to this as a resource for friends or family that you know who might be dealing with it. So super helpful, even if it doesn't happen in your exact family. And I think too, you know, parents so often, especially when they have littles, it's something that's like in the back of your mind, a lot of these topics. It's like, well, what if that happens? Or what if I see that? And so for our parents with younger listeners, you know, we're future focused parenting, like to be thinking forward and going, hey, if I see that, I want to be prepared for that. And I really hope that we're able to do that for our listeners with this little series. So today we are going to tackle depression, which is a much bigger issue than 30 minutes worth of discussion. So we're going to scratch the surface of that today. And we have a fabulous guest with us. I'm so excited she's here. We have Elizabeth Vu on the show today. Liz, you want to say hi? Yes. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to read your awesome bio here, and then we'll dive right in. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. Okay. So Elizabeth Vu received her master's degree in clinical social work from the University of St. Thomas, St. Catherine University, and received postgraduate training in psychodynamic psychotherapy, where she explored the intersections of attachment theory, human development, and the healing process of therapy, which sounds, oh my gosh, that sounds so interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, she integrates trauma healing methods, neurobiology, and depth-oriented psychotherapy into her work with children, adolescents, and adults in her private practice here in Washington State. She's in Bellevue, Washington. So Liz, thank you for being with us. Can you start by just introducing yourself a little bit more and maybe tell our listeners how you came to this work? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so again, thank you so much for having me and for providing this space to talk about some difficult topics that parents may be facing. Um, so my educational background, like you said, is in clinical social work. Um, and for the first part of my career, I did home and community-based services work, um, which meant visiting lots of families in their homes, listening to understand their needs and connecting them to resources. And then I spent several years in school-based mental health, where I worked at an elementary school providing uh, therapy to students there. And then now, of course, like you said, I'm a therapist in private practice. My first exposure to social work, though, happened when I was much younger, as my family cared for foster children during most of my childhood. Uh, I learned a lot through those experiences, and that really helped develop in me a curiosity about others and their stories. Uh, so that ultimately became my profession, and I just kept getting more and more fascinated by our emotions, our relationships, 
and help people make meaning in their lives. That's really special. I appreciate how often it's so true that we sometimes come to our path, maybe professionally, because of something we experienced personally. Mm -hmm. So your family having foster children, doing that for you, that is a an interesting angle. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So as we as we start the conversation about depression itself, it's really helpful to get a clear foundation and definition of terms and even what we really are talking about. So from your perspective as a professional, would you be willing to just start with how you define depression? Yeah, absolutely. So depression is different from the feeling of sadness, which everyone experiences from time to time. Um, depression is extreme sadness or despair that lasts for more than a few days. It interferes with typical functioning, and it can even cause physical pain, um, like headaches or stomach aches. Um, as a therapist, I think of depression as an emotional state in which a person is pulling away from external life, from engaged life. They're kind of like going inward. Um, and it can feel very alone, isolating, shame-filled, and stuck. Mm, that's a really powerful definition. I really like that, the idea that we're pulling away from living when we're depressed. I think that's really I've, I've not heard it that way before, and I really like that. Liz, something I really appreciated, and we've been kind of talking about this throughout the mental health series, but it's so important, so I just wanted to thank you for doing it, is giving us also the distinction between depression and just feeling sad for a few days. I think that's really important for parents to know, too, because just like we do as adults, kids will sometimes have a sad day or two or have a hard time here and there. And so I'm appreciative to you that you created that distinction for us of how is depression set apart from that? So thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. So could you talk to our listeners and to us about what are some of the common causes or triggers for depression and also what symptoms or behaviors should parents be looking for and how do they know then when to seek help? And I think actually even your definition started to talk about this, which is great, but can you just flesh that out a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the clinical diagnosis of depression, uh, which is what we're talking about, right, as we said, kind of distinct from sadness, um, depression can be caused by a combination of genetic, biological, environmental, social, and psychological factors. Um, so sometimes we see depression showing up as a response after a difficult experience, event, or relationship. Um, for example, after a loss, uh, trauma, or a social rejection. Um, and so there are typical symptoms that a therapist or doctor would be looking out for. Uh, and we should keep in mind that these symptoms um, are coming from kind of a Western medical model. So it may differ depending on kind of cultural background and um, environmental kind of situation. So these symptoms, um, it's a long list, but these symptoms are um, prolonged sadness or feelings of emptiness, feelings of helplessness or hopelessness, feelings of guilt or worthlessness, anger and irritability, restlessness, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, changes in sleep patterns and appetite changes, chronic pain, headaches or stomach aches, loss of interest in activities, withdrawal from friends and family, and thoughts of death or suicide. So when we're assessing for depression, we're looking for changes from their typical functioning. So it could be a slow and gradual shift or it might appear abruptly. Um, and sometimes the developmental changes, like what we see in adolescence, can parallel depression symptoms, like spending a whole lot more time alone in your room. Um, but this time alone is important and can be necessary for development. So the concern or the distinction would be, are they missing out on other aspects of their life? Are they completely disengaging from social contacts? Or um, if it's combined with other signals that something's up. So in depression, we're looking for several of these symptoms happening at the same time. It's really, I love, I love this because I feel like you set this up so beautifully at the start, that idea of withdrawing from life. And 
kind of bearing that in mind and using that as a gauge, even with these symptoms that you're talking about. You know, there's a big difference between a kid who's like spending a lot of time in their room, but still going out with their friends and still doing their sports and all of that. That's a really helpful way to distinguish between a kid who's just being a developmentally appropriate kid and a kid who's maybe struggling with some big right. feelings. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. So say a parent has seen some of what you've just described, Liz, how, and they've decided, you know, I, I maybe need to seek some help. This might be beyond just a sad day or two or something that is in my wheelhouse as a parent. Mm -hmm. So what, can you maybe talk about what quality help for this issue would look like, what it should include? How does a parent make sure they're not just getting slapped with a quick diagnosis and not getting long-term support for depression for their child. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a very um, uncomfortable situation to be slapped with the diagnosis. And then, and then what do you do? Right. Um, so getting at that diagnosis is just the first step of getting help. Um, and parents who are concerned about their child having depression are probably really nervous and scared for their child's well-being. Um, maybe it's a new experience or they've been through depression themselves and they're concerned about this happening to a child. So we can try to see it as an opportunity to empower the child or adolescent to pay attention to their feelings and symptoms and to the systems that are at work. Many parents' first step is to talk to the doctor about what's going on, the potential causes and their treatment recommendations. Um, school counselors and school social workers are really excellent resources in the community as well. And they might also be picking up on um, something um, not going well for that child. Good quality care might look like a lot of different things. It might look like psychotherapy, cognitive behavior therapy, play therapy if it's a younger child, uh, trauma treatment or groups, um, depending on the symptoms and causes. Good quality care will feel from the therapist or the kind of treatment provider, it will feel attuned, it will feel caring and curious. Now, sometimes medication is recommended in certain cases. Medication might be necessary to help stabilize the child's functioning and make the other interventions more effective. If you're able to work with a child psychiatrist, they may be really supportive if you're concerned about your child being on medication. And because medication for depression has an increased risk of causing suicidal thoughts, many professionals prefer to start with psychotherapy first, but this depends on individual factors. Wow. I like that. You said caring, attentive, and curious. Is that right? Uh, attuned. Yeah. Attuned. Attuned, yes. I thought you might like curious. Yeah, yeah. I did. I Of course I did. I love curious. I'm... I'm very curious myself. And I, I think I love that. I love that curiosity needs to be a part of the treatment, right? Because figuring out what's going on, right? And having a support system, including the therapist, also being curious instead of, you know, laying down diagnosis and this, that, and the other and getting really rigid about it, that it's that curiosity is also going to make the child feel so seen and heard as well. Right. I, I love that. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. Um, and then when we come back, Liz is going to share with us how parents can best support a child or a teen dealing with depression and what are the things you should absolutely not be doing? <laughs> what are the biggest mistakes that parents make? So we will be right back. So we just wanted to take a moment to talk about an incredible photographer that we had a chance to work with. Her name is Christy Tamsin, and she does a pretty unique style of photography, and we are really excited to just share with you a little bit about our experience. Dina and I had um, our professional photos done with her and a lot of what you see on social media she did. And then we also in our family had our family photos done with her before COVID hit and had the most amazing experience. So Dina, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about what it was like to work with her because it was pretty special. It was. And it, and it was a lot of fun too. I would say Christy really makes the photo time fun. And here's what I think really sets her apart is that she did not have us pose or 
stand in certain ways. She actually just documented our work day, essentially. And so what we ended up with were these beautiful array of pictures that just really captured what we do on a day-to-day basis at Future Focus Parenting. And, and she does the same for families, which is so nice. So you're going to get to see your family actually living. And you got to do that with her, right, Kira? Oh my gosh, it was amazing. I literally cried when I saw these photos because, you know, you think of a family photo as like this beautiful posed family photo and you all look perfect and you never look like that. And even in just preparing for her to come, I didn't clean the house. Like we didn't put on special clothes. She said, just be yourselves. I want to capture your family. And these photos are beautiful. Like we read as a family on the couch together all the time. So we just read and she took pictures of us and they are so intimate and so real and so personal. We went to a park and played and she just captured us like playing with our kids. And especially as the mom, like I'm never in the photo ever, Mm. (laughs) you know, so she captured our family as a whole. It was absolutely spectacular. We can't recommend her enough. And here's what's so great too, for those of you who might be concerned about photography during this unique time, Christy really cares about keeping her clients safe and is taking all the precautions to protect clients. So right now she's coming to photograph wearing a mask and she's only doing backyard or outdoor sessions. So for those of you who might have been a little wary, I think that can really help just knowing how much Christy cares about her clients and wants to take care of you. Yeah. And I I really can't say enough about being captured as you are. And she said something in the session that I thought was so great. She said, there's something really special about sending a message to your kids that I don't have to pretty you up to make you worthy of being photographed. And I thought that was really cool. And that's definitely what we experienced. So if you're interested in working with Christy, she's fab. You can follow uh, the link on our social media. Pretty much any picture you see of Dina and I, she has photographed and there's a link there. Or you can go to Christy Tamsin Photography, K-R-I-S-T-I. T-A-M-C-S-I-N photography.com. And we'll put a link in our show notes. Okay, Liz. So can you share with our listeners, because I think in some ways, this is the question that most parents want the answer to. If my child is dealing with depression, if we see these signs, we realize that it's time to get help. What do I do? How do I support my little person who's dealing with this? And what are the things that I shouldn't do? What are the common mistakes that parents make that if if you as a therapist were like, if I could just tell parents not to do this, they would just make such a huge difference in their child's, you know, process through this experience of depression? Right. So every child and adolescent needs to feel loved for who they are becoming. Um, It's so important that parents stay present and receptive rather than reactive. Um, This can be done by trying to understand that interior experience of the child, that's that curiosity, um, and by keeping the lines of communication open. If this is happening in your family, it can be very helpful to take a moment to reflect on what comes up for you, how this relates to your own experiences with emotional struggles, and explore whether you're being reactive to their feelings. Um, Teens are especially very good at picking up on these sometimes negative unspoken feelings, even if we think we're doing a really good job kind of keeping it under wraps. Parents and loved ones can also support that child or teen by just engaging in activities that might help provide a distraction, like doing a puzzle or cooking together or doing something physical like playing basketball, going for a walk, or doing some gentle yoga together. And then some common missteps might be um, trying to get your child out of their sad feelings quickly um, by trying to be super positive. Um, or by shaming, like saying, oh, look at all the great things you have, or so many kids have it worse. Um, Having perspective is really great, and it can be helpful, but that's where sadness, disappointment, and depression differ. So I encourage parents to be curious with their child about their feelings, to accept and reflect them, and that allows feelings to cycle through and perhaps resolve on their own, rather than expressing that the feelings should be different or be over with quickly, which minimizes or rejects the child's experience. So can you can you give some examples of what that would look like on both sides? Right. So let's pretend we have Jack and Jack is 12 and Jack is struggling with depression. Um, Give us an example of an interaction between Jack and a parent that you feel is doing those things like accepting and validating. and an example of what it would look like if, if a parent didn't do that. 
because I think it gets really muddy in in this for a lot of parents. And and I love I remember when we spoke on the phone, you were saying, you know, so much of this is actually also what's happening for the parent and how they feel about their child being sad. Um, And so I just love for you to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think about kind of how these two um, scenarios might go, right? So if there's a, a parent who's maybe, um, maybe they went through depression when they were a teenager, but they didn't have anyone to talk to, or or they were really ashamed or had to kind of hide away their feelings um, for some other purpose, um, they might see, you know, their 12-year-old son um looking sad, looking like they might have depression, and maybe trying to get them to kind of get out of those feelings kind of quickly, because that brings up a whole um, kind of maybe flood of emotions that they don't know necessarily how to um, how to sit with or how to um, kind of tolerate, right? Because a lot of this is being able to tolerate this range of feelings. Um, rather than kind of making them go away, right? There's there's no such thing as a bad feeling. They're just feelings and they come and go. Um, depression's a little bit different, like I was saying before about kind of sadness as a feeling and depression as kind of a, a diagnosis or a disorder. Um, so a parent who's um, maybe a little bit more self-aware or able to regulate themselves, they can join their child. So being able to just kind of sit with them, um, kind of slow down, um, ask a lot of questions, you know, or just share stories. It's really about kind of listening and and just like the good quality care from the therapist who would feel attuned. It's the same kind of thing, right? Can the parent um, slow down and pay attention and just kind of wonder with the child, you know, I wonder if you're feeling um, really said that we had to move, um, you know, or that you haven't seen your friends because of, you know, we're in the middle of this pandemic and that's a lot of stress. Um, I think that can be scary for some parents to uh, approach the negative feelings, um, but I it, it shows the child or the adolescent that they're not feelings to be feared. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So if we can approach it, then we can understand it and work through it. But if we try to push it away and say, no, 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 that's bad. Or but just thinking about teaching children that, that all feelings can be um, tolerated and they're, and they are trying to communicate something to us. So it's that curiosity. How do we approach it with curiosity? Yeah. And you, and you gave that great example of, you know, saying, look at all the wonderful things you have you know, trying to approach it with positivity. Are there other phrases that parents use that are dismissive without intending to be? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like things like, um, yeah, kind of trying to be positive or looking on the bright side um, or the shaming comments might sound something like, uh, so many kids have it worse or don't you appreciate all that we do for you? Um, don't you appreciate all that you have? Those are not particularly helpful because, again, it's trying to pull that child out of what they're feeling. Um, and that can feel kind of dismissive. Yeah, that makes sense. It does. It makes a ton of sense. And I think probably many of those phrases really come from a well-meaning place. The parents aren't aren't meaning to be dismissive. They They genuinely want to be helpful. I'm sure it's quite stressful for the parent as well to be walking alongside a child who's dealing with depression. So it's really tricky when sometimes our, our best well-intentioned things maybe are the, are the pitfall that we're trying to avoid. That's, that's tricky. So thanks for highlighting some of those that we can watch out for. Well, and I think it must, it must feel very counterintuitive if you've got a child who's down to actually lean into that, right? I would think as a parent, the fear is like, oh, I don't want to make it worse. I don't want to let them go deeper down the spiral or wallow more. But as we have found with everyone we've talked to in this mental health series, everyone's saying exactly that. You got to lean in. You got to listen. You got to, you know, don't try and make it go away. That actually makes it so much worse. So I think for parents to hear that again and to, especially with this topic, no, you're not going to make them more depressed by walking alongside them or letting them feel it. 
you're actually more likely to pull them out of it <laughs> if you do that. But it, it does feel uncomfortable. Yeah, I think that's probably a pretty normal – normal isn't even the word I'm looking for. I think it's an understandable fear to think, well, what if I end up being the person who made a mountain out of a molehill, right? Like, And that that's a, a tricky thing to kind of push against, I think, as a parent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is – it's not an easy path. And it's, you know, raising – children and when you're seeing these signs of depression um it can be really scary and, and i think you're right there's um you know parents want to be really protective of their children and protect them from these difficult feelings and difficult experiences and um it's a lot of stress it's a lot of pressure and so that's another thing too that i recommend and and i'm sure you've kind of heard this from other speakers is um, you know, if your child is getting treatment for depression, um, you know, it's, it could be really helpful to ask, you know, yourself, what kind of support do I need? You know, would it be through a parenting group or just having a close friend or your own therapist to talk to? Because so many things can get um, stirred up when, um, you know, when children are going through this. Getting your own help or getting family support also sends a message to your child that they're not a problem. And it's a family concern that you're willing to work on together. The good news is that most kids recover from depression and the experience of asking for help, getting support and feeling cared for by their family is a resource they can return to many times over in their life. And I love that idea that it sends the message that you're not a problem that we're trying to deal with, that we love you and we want to work with you. And I think that's I think that's really it. I mean, that is, that's a very powerful perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, and here's the other thing with that, with that parent support side that I was thinking about as you were talking, Liz, is it's also great modeling for them to see, look, I, I'm an adult and I'm also going to get some support right now. So it's not like you're the, you're the quote problem child. Right. Uh, everyone sometimes has hard times and they get support for them. And that's how we work through them rather than just trying to push it aside. We're working through something and not, it's a problem to solve. I'm a person who needs some support right now. So the modeling piece is really nice too. I was thinking about that as you talked about it. I, I, I'm thankful that you did that, like highlighted, like as a parent, you get you get some support too. take good care of yourself. Yeah. And that Pete, that last piece about if you if you walk this well, if you send that message to your child, like, hey, we're in this together, we're going to work on this together. They return to you for years and years to come because you've set the tone for when things are hard. I, I'm here. I've got you. I, I'm a, I'm a safe place. I love that. They'll want to come to you mm -hmm. instead of I'm not going to tell my mom or dad right. about this. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So if our listeners hearing this have found this helpful and might have follow-up questions or maybe are even interested in working with you, how can they find you? Can you tell us how our listeners can connect with you if they want to learn more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, anyone can find me at my website, which is innerrootscounseling.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Liz. We really appreciate your insight and uh, that beautiful definition. I will I will personally carry that with me as a as a compass. I think it's just really great and everything you brought to the table today is just so helpful for our listeners. So thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Well, everyone, we hope that you found Liz's thoughts on this topic helpful. I know that I did. Dina, I'm sure you did too. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's a heavy one and yeah, an important one. So is. I really appreciate her thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. And we just want to remind you as listeners that if you are looking for some extra support um, in your parenting journey, feel free to join the FFP family and become a member. We have membership options available. If you go to futurefocusedparenting.com and click on membership, you can see all the different ways to engage with us and support the show. We thank you so much for listening. We're so grateful to our listeners. If you haven't yet subscribed to the show, we really recommend hitting that subscribe button so those episodes just pop up in your feed every single week. And if this episode was helpful, do share it with a friend. As Dina and I talked about at the top of the show, this particular series is one that we hope is going to reach outside of the FFP community because there are a lot of parents who would benefit from hearing all the wonderful thoughts that our experts have brought to bear uh, for this particular series. Next week, we finish our final episode of the mental health series. We're going to be talking about self-harm. It's a heavy one, but really, really important. So do be sure to join us for that. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll be back with you next week. 
Raising Adults is produced by Kira Dorian and Dina Thayer and recorded partially in my laundry room and partially in Dina's office. Music by Seattle band Hannah Lee. Thanks for listening.